Hey, it's Lara here with your horoscopes for the solar eclipse in Taurus that's happening on April 30th, 2022. Thanks for being here. In this video, we're going to break down um, all of the pieces that pertain to this solar eclipse on the 30th. But beyond that, we're going to talk about this eclipse cycle that we're in for, you know, the next 18 months or so, the Taurus Scorpio eclipse cycle and what that means in general and what it means for each sign. So closer to the end of the video, as I always do, I take it through all 12 signs and I give you your individual horoscope and what to expect. So stick around for that. If you're new to my channel, I'm glad you stopped by. I hope you decide to stay. Please like, subscribe, all the things. It really helps me grow the channel. And, um, you know, if you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear them in the, uh, in the comments below. So let's, um, let's dive in because we have a lot to talk about. First of all, the sun has entered Taurus as of the recording of this video that happened on the 19th um, of April. So happy birthday if you're a Taurus sun sign and big things are happening for Taurus because not only do we have the sun in Taurus, but we've got the eclipse happening in Taurus and this eclipse cycle in general is hitting Taurus very personally. We also have Uranus still in Taurus and we're going to talk about what that means in relation to this eclipse cycle as well. And then um, just the other two things I want to mention quickly before we dive into talking about the specific eclipse is that before that eclipse ha happens, the day before, in fact, on April 30th, we will have Mercury moving into Gemini and Mercury will retrograde in Gemini. So we'll be making, um, you know, having an extended stay in Gemini, which is one of the signs that it rules. So we'll talk about that in a future video. But we've also got um, that same day Pluto stationing retrograde, which happens every year for about five-ish months at a time. So that in and of itself is not anything, you know, remarkable or unusual. Um, but, you know, Pluto, <laughs> Pluto is nearing the end of its journey in Capricorn. And it's been a long haul since 2008. Um, there's been a lot of deep, deep, uh, changes and evolution going on in that area, right? In the Capricorn area of our chart. And so when any planet stations retrograde, it's kind of a, a stepping back, a turning inward of that energy. It is um, a reevaluation in some ways of whatever that particular planet signifies, right? And as it pertains to what house it's sitting in in our chart. So I just wanted to, to let you know that. Um, the other thing is I, I'll remind you that, of course, I'll be back in two weeks time to talk about the eclipse that's happening in Scorpio because this lunation is a solar eclipse, right? Which is a new moon. Um, and the next one is a full moon. It's a lunar eclipse in Scorpio. So that's happening on the 16th and I'll be back in plenty of time to, to talk about that. Um, so I hope you come back. And if you want to find out more information about me and what I do and how I can help you and readings and all that kind of stuff, you can head over to my website, astrologymaven.com, and you can learn more there. And the link is below. Okay, let's get into it. So the partial solar eclipse in Taurus is happening at between 10 and 11 degrees of Taurus. Taurus is a fixed earth sign. And this is actually um, the second eclipse that's happened on this particular axis of Scorpio Taurus, right? The second eclipse in Taurus. Now, the way eclipses work is that they happen, we have four to six eclipses a year, usually four, but sometimes six, and they happen in, in pairs. And we have them in the spring and in the fall. So, um, the eclipse cycles themselves last for 18 months to two years, roughly, meaning that all of the eclipses over that period of time will be in the same two signs, in this case, Scorpio and Taurus. Now, the first one happened um, back in November, November 19th, 2021, that we had a partial lunar eclipse in Taurus. So that kicked off this particular eclipse cycle. 
So we had a partial lunar eclipse in Taurus, then the eclipse cycle that we were in, which was Gemini Sagittarius, finished off the year. So kind of wrapped things up, right? And now we're headed sort of full, full speed ahead into the Scorpio Taurus eclipses. So if you think back to, you know, November, um, late November of 2021, and think about something that may have transpired that tipped you off as to what this eclipse cycle might be about for you. And if you don't know, don't worry about it, because that's what we're going to talk about in a little bit when I take it through all 12 signs. Um, so I was mentioning to you that eclipses work in cycles here. And what makes an eclipse? Let's talk about that first. Well, the moon and the sun orbit, right? So the moon orbits the earth and the earth orbits the sun. And when the moon and the sun cross paths on the path of the sun is called the ecliptic. So when the moon crosses the ecliptic, there there's a point in the sky that we call the node. So there's a south node and a north node where um, the path of the sun and the moon cross. These are not actual celestial bodies you know they're not some material like planet they're points in the sky and whenever the new moons or full moons get within a particular range of those points those nodes that's what makes an eclipse so all eclipses are new moons or full moons but they're special um, so, and about every nine years, the nodes are in the same signs. So nine years ago, the nodes were in Scorpio and Taurus, but they were reversed. So we had the south node in Taurus and the north node in Scorpio. Um, but the last time we had this exact same configuration with the north node in Scorpio and the south node in Taurus, with the north node in uh, Taurus, oh my goodness, and the south node in Scorpio. That happened between the fall of 2002 and um, the spring of 2005. So, and those dates actually, I can give them to you real quick here because I do happen to have them in my notes. So we had um, November 19th, 2002, um, was an eclipse in Scorpio. May 15th, 2003 was an eclipse in Taurus. November 8th, 2003, Scorpio eclipse. May 4th, 2004, Taurus eclipse. October 27th, 2004, Scorpio eclipse. And April 24th, 2005, the last eclipse in that cycle, which was um, in Taurus. Now, the really interesting thing about this is that these were all lunar eclipses. I didn't realize that actually until I went back and really looked um, at these dates and I looked at the specifics. So I knew that's when, you know, we had this last sort of similar eclipse cycle going on, but I didn't realize that every single one of those eclipses was a lunar eclipse. Why is that significant? Okay because lunar eclipses are full moons. So every eclipse that happened in that last period of time when we had the nodes in the same place, all were full moons. So what do full moons signify? They signify culminations, endings, um, turning points, crisis, um, things coming to the surface to be illuminated, you know, emotional catharsis, things bearing fruit, all of these sorts of things. So it was a big period there where we were experiencing some very, very powerful, amped up, like full moon energy. Um, so if you look back at that period of time that I just mentioned to you between the fall of 2002 and the spring of 2005, what was going on in your life? Think about that. But think about it specifically as it pertains to the houses that Scor Scorpio and Taurus occupy in your birth chart. And um, 
again, if you don't know that, we're going to take it through the signs at the end of the video here. But um, I just want to give you an example. There was a lot, a lot, a lot going on in, in you know, my life and my husband's life around that time. And in fact, my husband, who has five planets in Scorpio um, and his natal Saturn in Taurus, went through very, very challenging times. And um, 2003 was probably the worst year of our lives. A lot. We've had a lot of challenges, but um, it was a, it was a real. It sucked <laughs> on a number of levels, um, but you know, I can't blame it all on the eclipses. There were a lot of other factors going on at that time that didn't have anything to do with the eclipses, right? Other configurations in the chart that were reflecting these difficulties as well. And so, and the other thing is, although it was a really difficult period in some ways, it was also a time when there were big shifts and changes. Um, like I got my first teaching job, we had our first child, you know, and, and there were many other good things that happened as well. So, um, but it was a real, you know, there were a lot of turning points that happened during that time, but they weren't all bad. So if you think back, I, I'm telling you this because if you think back to that period and you're like, oh shit, <laughs> like, you know, some really bad stuff happened. I don't want you to panic because first of all, themes repeat, but it's, it's not in the same way. And when we have kind of a more a conscious awareness of these things, then we can exercise our free will, will, right? I mean, I always say astrology is this, it's an interplay of, of fate and free will. So we get to sort of choose how we respond to things. Um, so you might think like, how would I do things differently? Or how, even if there were things that went on that were out of your control, how could you have um, dealt with them differently maybe, right? Or think about um, the fact, like I was saying, that just because these eclipses are happening in the same areas of the sky, it doesn't mean that all the astro is exactly the same. So I just want you to, to remember that. And it's kind of like, I'm telling you this because I needed to hear this myself, right? So I wanted to share that with you. Um, it's really important that we don't sort of isolate one thing and fixate on that because we are the sum of our whole birth chart, not just one piece of it. So, and if you want to get a really solid foundation in terms of, you know, your chart, then um, you might consider taking my, my new course, which walks you through sort of what the heck is a birth chart, really? Like, what is a birth chart? What's my birth chart? What am I looking at when I look at that? Um, why I think it's essential to have one and how you can get yours online for free. But Beyond that, like how you can make sure it's accurate, you're getting the right chart, right? Because you want to have a strong foundation. Otherwise, you know, you can be starting from a place of misinformation or confusion or um, misinterpretation, these sorts of things. And then at some point down the road, you have to turn around and, and sort of correct that or relearn or unlearn some things, right? So anyways, that course is available. It's um, on my website and it's self-paced and you get access to it right away. And um, it's priced at 49 bucks Canadian. So, you know, it's a, it's a real good deal um, and you'll learn a lot. So you can check that out if you want. But my point is you're the sum of your whole chart, right? You're not just one thing. So I want you to remember that. Um, now this eclipse cycle, so that eclipse cycle, like I said, all lunar eclipses, pretty wild, like a lot of sort of endings and wrapping things up and, and that sort of thing. Um, but this eclipse cycle is different because it's got lunar eclipses and solar eclipses. So there's this bouncing back and forth um, that's like endings and beginnings, right? This time around. So we're not just talking about 
sort of big dramatic crescendos, we're also talking about new seeds being planted and fresh starts and, um, you know, the initiation of, of new things that we hope to grow in the future, that sort of thing. So we're going to talk now about the, the themes of eclipses in general. Um, I've touched on that a little bit already, but we'll, we'll dive into it a little bit deeper. And then we're going to talk about the themes of the Scorpio Taurus axis specifically, right? And then we're going to take it through the 12 signs. So, and when I do that, I'll let you know sort of who, who is most likely to experience these eclipses more potently or personally or significantly as well. So stick around for that. Um, so like I was saying, all eclipses are new and full moons, but they're new and full moons where there is a disruption in the force, so to speak, right? Because the light is disrupted in some way, shape, or form. Um, they can be partial eclipses or they can be total eclipses. And that depends on how close the moon is the moon and the sun are to the, the lunar nodes, right? The nodes, those points I was talking to you about earlier. Um, solar new moon eclipses happen when the moon moves between the sun and the earth and it it blocks the light of the sun, right? So, it, so normally the sun is shining on the earth and the moon crosses over and and blocks the light of the sun from shining on earth. So it's like, <laughs> it interrupts our regularly scheduled programming, right? If you're of a, a certain vintage, you'll, you'll recognize that phrase um, where, you know, you'd be watching your show on Friday night or Saturday night. And, and all of a sudden, um, you know, an announcer would break in and go, we interrupt this regularly scheduled programming to bring you a special news bulletin. And it would be some, major world event or something that was going on, right? So an eclipse is kind of like that. It disrupts the regularly scheduled programming. Um, to in, in a case of a solar eclipse, a new moon eclipse, it interrupts that, that programming to bring us something new, to bring us news. It's like a moment where the lights go out and then they come back on and things look different. There's something new. You notice something new. Um, so that's a solar eclipse and eclipse and lunar or full moon eclipses, right? In that case, the earth blocks the sun's rays from hitting the moon. So the moon emits no light of, of its own. It reflects the light of the sun and at a full moon, it fully reflects the light of the sun, which is why it looks full, right? Um, but when the earth shadow when the earth casts a shadow at a lunar eclipse, then it blocks the rays of the sun from hitting the moon. So the moon can't reflect the, the sunlight. So it's another disruption to the light, right? Um, but it's kind of, it's, it's in a different way. And if you think about, you know, before the days when we had electricity or forms of light, um, our ancestors would navigate by the light of the moon. And when the moon was full, it was brighter. So there were more things you could do into the late hours. Um, you could see, you know, beyond your, your little sort of space. Um, and so that's a feeling of ease in some ways because you can see what's out in the, the darkness, right? But when you know, you're counting on that and, you, and you're, you're, you're tracking the, the moon cycles, which, which people did. Um, and all of a sudden, what you're used to doesn't happen. It's disrupted. That can be quite scary. And, and so, you know, in ancient times, those eclipses were often associated with fearful things because of that exact reason that I just mentioned to you. Um, even think about animals who are very connected to lunar cycles. And when 
there's this disruption. You know, there's normally a full moon. We normally have this full circle of light in the sky and it doesn't happen or it's disrupted um, because of an eclipse, then it's like you're thrown off kilter, right? So, and, and you're kind of forced to change your routine in some way and, and do things differently. So lunar eclipses are, are, are like that. And they are, as I, I was saying, like a regular full moon and associated with all those full moon things that I mentioned earlier. But the the events that happen, right, those culminating events or those emotional catharsis um, or um, catharsis, I guess, I don't know if that's the plural, um, or the, you know, the bearing of fruit um, or what have you, they're, they're extra. So say, let me give you an example. Say you're having um, eclipses in your 10th house of career, public life, that sort of thing. So maybe at a regular full moon in that house, one that's particularly hitting your chart, maybe, you know, there's a particular job you're doing in your organization and you, there's a full moon moment there for you. Like in, maybe that, that particular job ends um, or you, and you're doing something new or you reach, you level up in that particular job or something like that. But at an eclipse, that might look like you deciding to completely change careers, right? Like you're gonna leave that career, that organization, and you're gonna start something new. Or for whatever reason, that that job ends, that career ends. Um, and you have to, you know, it's like the light goes off and when it comes back on, something new has to, to start. So um, that's the sort of, flavor of eclipses or energy of eclipses. That's, that's, that's what happens. Now let's talk specifically about these eclipses on the Taurus Scorpio axis, right? So we're thinking about those solar and lunar eclipses, the, the big new endings and beginnings, the shifts, the changes. It's, it's like when an eclipse happens, it's like the universe yells plot twist. Um, and that's kind of extra this time around because of something that's happening in relation to this family of eclipses. And I'll, I'll get to that in a sec, but let's talk about Taurus and Scorpio. So, so we are having plot twists in the Taurus Scorpio areas of our chart and in relation to the themes of Taurus and Scorpio, what are, what are Taurus and Scorpio about? Taurus and Scorpio are opposite signs, right? So they're kind of like two sides of the same coin. Um, and this axis in general is about a number of things, but it, it speaks a lot to resources and being our personal resources, the Taurus piece, you know, what we own kind of thing and our collective or shared resources, which is the Scorpio piece. It's like our individual money versus sort of big money. Um, it can be about our survival needs. Taurus and our instincts, right? Scorpio, um, simplicity, Taurus, complexity, Scorpio, the physical Taurus and the metaphysical or um, the psychological Scorpio. It can be about the building of foundations, Taurus. Taurus is a fixed earth sign, right? And the transforming or the evolution um, or the alchemizing of those foundations, Scorpio. It can also be about our attachments. Scorpio and Taurus are both fixed signs. They are attached to certain, you know, ideologies or, you know, ways of being or um, people or things, or it's just this notion of hanging on to things, right? The fixed signs are slow to change. They're more about being, um, they prefer that stability. And sometimes that's much needed, but sometimes it can keep this sense of stuckness, right? And not wanting to, to, to move or change. So those are um, 
the themes that are being highlighted for all of us over this sort of 18 month to two year eclipse cycle in Taurus and Scorpio. And I think that it's pretty obvious at this point in time that resources are a big theme for all of us. Um, you know, right from talking about things like our food supply to inflation and how, you know, the, um, the people with the most money have, you know, they don't have to worry so much about their survival. Whereas, you know, other people, it's, that's, that's a different story. Right. And, and, um, there is this movement to kind of paring down, simplifying, um, you know, back to basics, which is very Taurus, right? Concern about the earth, um, all of those things, very, very Taurus. Now, the thing I didn't mention when I was talking about the nodes is the north node, which is currently in Taurus, is about what it's about the future in some ways it's about what we are moving towards or what we are being called to move towards or um instinctually kind of drawn towards it's about you know where our focus needs to be it can be in some ways about what is all consuming as well right um and then the south node which is in scorpio is is about what needs to be released, what, um, where we have had a lot of experiences and now it's time to sort of let go of what we no longer need as far as that goes and, and, you know, kind of, um, integrate, um, and move on and, or release what, what's no longer needed. Um, it's about the, like purging things. It is about um, the past, right? Whereas the North Node is about the future. And I'm kind of combining ancient views about the nodes and modern psychological astrology, right? So I, that's my approach because I've sort of been trained in, in both. And I do that, I bring those those things together, those two approaches together, because I think there is great value in both of them. So um, if you want to just really simplify it, you can think of the North Node as what we're moving towards, what we are um, drawn towards, what we need to incorporate more of, but not to the point of losing our heads, so to speak. Um, and then the self note is what, you know, our past experiences, like I said, and what needs to be released and um, sort of not held on so tightly to. So hopefully that helps you. Now, we've got the North Node in Taurus in this case and the South Node in Scorpio. So we are looking to um, or we are drawn to those Taurian themes, right, of stability, of um getting our, our needs met, our basic needs met, of our survival, of uh, attention to to the earth and to nature, um, to to our, our resources and, you know, material world in some way. Um, and so with the North Node in Taurus, there seems to be this moving towards a a rebuilding our foundations in some way rebuilding of all that's been torn down and destroyed over you know these last few years in particular um and beyond really but sometimes it's hard to kind of stretch our minds way back right um, but i think that we can all relate to certain things that have gone on over the last few years that have really shaken the foundation of our lives collectively, but individually as well. And so this North Nord, no, ugh, excuse me, North Node in Taurus is calling us to rebuild our foundations, right? From the ground up, a solid foundation. Um, so if you have any placements in Taurus and in Scorpio um, and in the other two fixed signs, which are Leo and Aquarius, 
then this eclipse is more personal for you. This family of eclipses will be more personal for you, right? And the closer those placements are to the degree of the eclipse, the more you will feel it. So in this case, the solar eclipse, it's a partial solar eclipse in Taurus, um, happens between 10 and 11 degrees of Taurus. The sun and the moon will both be there because it's a new moon, right? Solar eclipse, new moon. When the sun and the moon come together to initiate something new, to conceive of something new. Um, so ten, if you have placements around there in your chart, and I'll repeat that for you before we go through all signs, um, then this will be a more significant eclipse for you. Now, we also have Uranus sitting there in Taurus. And Uranus is at 14 degrees, so pretty close to where the eclipse is happening. Um, within three, four degrees of the eclipse, right? So that's significant. So Uranus is a player here in this eclipse. And Uranus is the disruptor, right? So Uranus as a, as a planet kind of has in some ways the energy of an eclipse in that it can be sudden and it can be, um, it jolt electrifying in some way, um, a sudden change, a sudden insight, aha moment, sudden information, um, innovation, you know, flash of genius, um, some kind of disruption, shake up, you know, that kind of thing. Think of if you're somebody that's into tarot, think of the tower card, right? And in, in the tarot. Um, and then we've got the south node is about 12 degrees away from, from this new moon at 22 degrees Taurus. So that's what makes it a partial solar eclipse. And it's not a, a total solar eclipse because the, um, the lunation is happening like a little bit of in the same sign as, but distanced from the node, right? The closer to the node, like I was saying, then the more chance of it being a total eclipse. So in this case, it's a partial solar eclipse and partial eclipses, all things being equal, tend to be slightly less intense than total. Now, I'm going to break down. I mentioned that Uranus is there conjunct the eclipse. There's a couple of other things going on, and I just want to bring those into the conversation here before I take it through the signs. So with Uranus conjunct the eclipse, we've got this kind of like jolt, right? Bazinga kind of thing. Electricity, a moment of shock and awe, an awakening, a surprise of some description. Um, in the Taurus area of the, the chart. And then we have the nodes in a square to Saturn in Aquarius, another fixed sign. The fixed signs all square each other, right? So uh, something about the events pertaining to this eclipse can feel challenging. Saturn, right? S Saturn often brings us challenges, um, can feel tense. It's a square requiring some level of responsibility, of maturity, of adulting. Um, it could be things surrounding time, the need for patience and hard work. And, you know, it, this is like on our trajectory, the, the south node and the north node speak to like our trajectory kind of thing. Um, and, and Saturn is in a, a square to that. So it's kind of like, again, disrupting the force in some way, forcing us to to notice something and to take action um, and to to pick a direction and to um, overcome an obstacle. So we've got that piece as well as the Uranus piece. And we also have Neptune, um, which is in a trine to the south node. And so this, when I was thinking about what is this, this conjures up sort of Im images to me of the, the floodgates opening, right? The dam bursting or sort of waves of compassion about the past because it's the south node or about the letting go or release of something. And then we have the moon and the sun in a strong sextile to Mars, which at the time of the eclipse is in Pisces. So Mars and Pisces will be at like 11 degrees. So very tight, tight um, sextile. Sextiles are conversations of, they're friendly conversations between the planets. They're conversations of support and opportunity. So, um, that is something beneficial here. And Mars is the planet of 
our drive and our will and our passion and our survival instinct and um you know it's related to so many things but that that mars energy is playing well with this eclipse right and then we have the ruler of the eclipse because when we talk about lunations we always have to talk about what's the ruler who who is the ruler of this lunation in terms of the planets well um, Venus is the ruler of Taurus and Venus is currently and at the time of the eclipse in Pisces the sign that Venus is exalted in right Venus is revered in Pisces Venus is very comfortable there so not only is Venus in the sign of its exaltation the ruler of the eclipse and the sign of its exaltation but we also have Venus in an exact conjunction to Jupiter at the time of this eclipse in Pisces Jupiter is at home in Pisces, right? Now, this combination between Jupiter and Venus happens about every three and a quarter years or so, but um, it doesn't happen in Pisces every three and a quarter years. So the last time that Venus and Jupiter came together in Pisces was 1974, 1975, right? So a long time ago. Um, so this is not an event that happens every day. So, um, this is this is good this this is good news it bodes well so it's interesting you may you may hear in this explanation there is sort of this sense of challenge and difficulty but also there's a sense of optimism and hope to be had it's kind of like <laughs> i don't know why this image pops into my mind but i think about like um you know, if you know anything about theater, and I am no expert, but um, the, the masks of, of the comedy and tragedy masks, right? And and it's almost like, or or the like, there's this sense of like cautious optimism. The other words, phrases that come into mind, it's like Beauty and the Beast, <laughs> or um, karmic events, because eclipse eclipses are related generally to sort of faded events, karmic events. So in this case, events that are challenging, but also supported by the hand of grace in some way. And this seems to be a theme of late, where it's like, there's so much challenge and difficulty, but there's also, there's also something working behind the scenes to support us and to, and to help us. Um, so, you know, I want you to keep that in mind that even if things seem challenging, there are reasons for uh, cautious optimism here, definitely. So again, if you have placements around the 7 to 14 degree of the fixed signs, Taurus, Scorpio, Leo, Aquarius, you will feel this eclipse more than some. Um, and keep in mind that the energies ripple out, right? So it's like, it's not like an event happens on that specific day. This is a story playing out over 18 months, two years of our lives. And when we have the eclipse seasons, it brings that, whatever that storyline is to the forefront for us. So that's what's going on this eclipse season. All right. So, oh, there's so much more I could say, but gosh, we're getting into a really long video here. Um, and I, I have a lot to say to each sign. So I'm going to start taking it through the signs and I'm going to um, speak to you in terms of what axis are these eclipses happening on for you? So meaning what houses do Taurus and Scorpio sit for you? Um, where might you experience the challenges of Saturn? In what area of life? And then I'll remind you once more, because I can't talk about it enough these days, where to look for the helpers, which are all in Pisces still. And I know I've been, you know, flogging that over many videos, but it's good to remember that because, again, that sense of sort of cautious optimism, the hand of grace, even, you know, though there are challenging things going on. So, <clears throat> um I am using, for those who are curious, whole sign houses, um, and these general horoscopes, I recommend that you listen to your rising sign. That is the most important because 
these are essentially rising sign horoscopes. They will be the most accurate if you listen for your rising sign. You can also listen for your sun sign, especially if you're a person, somebody in the comments, you know, was, was mentioning this. If you're somebody that has, um, I think it was last video, but has the sun in the first house of your chart. So your sun and your rising sign are the same. Well, it pertains to both, right? So rising sign, first and foremost, if you don't know your rising sign, um, go check out that course that I was talking about earlier. Um, and, but if you don't know your rising sign, you can still listen for your sun sign and your moon sign, and that will bring you some insight. Um, and it'll give you something to go on for sure. But the rising sign will be the most accurate. Okay, enough. Let's get on with it. And I'm going to start in this case with Taurus because this is your eclipse, right? So your, um, your new moon of the year, Taurus, is happening at an eclipse, at a solar eclipse. So this is significant. It is like a, a big new beginning for you in some way. Um, and it's happening on your first seventh house axis. So obviously Taurus, if you're a Taurus rising, you have, uh, that's your first house, right? You've, you've got the eclipse happening in your first house. And then you've got Scorpio across the sky in your seventh house where we will also have eclipses. Um, so let's talk about that piece first. This is where you're... At this particular eclipse in Taurus, you are at a point when there is a significant inception happening. Something new being conceived of, something, um, a new beginning that may be unexpected in some way. Uranus is right close to the eclipse. Um, a surprise twist um, in the storyline. Some kind of fresh start that comes out of nowhere. And this is as it relates to you because it's your first house and the first house is like the helm of the ship. It's, it's, um, how we enter the world, this physical incarnation, right? And so it speaks to our, our body, our, our vitality, um, our appearance, our, our, how we come at the world, how we approach the world, how the world perceives us, our relationship to ourself, right? These are all first house themes. When something happens in the first house, it is significant because it can impact the entirety of our lives because it's all about us. So look for, you know, what, what is coming into your awareness at this point that is something new as it pertains to those first house themes. It could feel like a bit of a jolt because you've got Uranus there. Um, and then it, it may have something to do with relationships because it's on the first seventh house axis that these eclipses are happening, right? And so um, it's you and versus the other, which is the seventh house, the other people that you're close to. It could be um, significant other. It could be close friends, family members. It could be business associates. could be something to do with contracts and agreements as they pertain to you as well. Um, so that's what to look for. That's the story playing out for you. It has to do with relationships and it has to do with you and others. Um, you know, to, to kind of boil it all down to the crux of the, of the issue. The challenge is maybe coming from your 10th house, Saturn in the 10th house, squaring the nodes. Saturn is, um, you know, the obstacles, the challenges, the hard work, um, the, the sort of, um, where you can't take any shortcuts, you know, all of that kind of thing. Now I, I spoke about these pieces in the intro. So listen to the intro for more of the goods. But that, that's where the challenges may be coming from. And then I will remind you one more time, look for the helpers in Pisces, which is the 11th area or 11th house of your chart, which is the group, your friends, networks, your, your um, pot potential benefactors, um, your allies and your supporters, right? And this can be people even online in this day and age. But that's where you're looking to that the support um, in whatever shape it takes. It could be people. It could it could be anything as it pertains to 
those 11th house themes um, is what can support you in this time. All right, Taurus, I'm going to leave it there for you and I'm going to move on to Gemini now. So Gemini, the specific eclipse that we're, happen that we're having here is happening in your 12th house. Now, so the eclipse in Taurus, solar eclipse in Taurus in the 12th. So there is something new being conceived of, initiated, coming into your awareness. It could be quite shocking, sudden um, plot twist as it pertains to endings, losses, um, things happening behind the scenes, what goes on behind closed doors things in your unconscious, your mental um, and spiritual health, your self-sabotaging behaviors, um, things pertaining to institutions like hospitals, um, long-term care facilities, hospices, prisons, spiritual retreat centers, um, any kind of place you can think of that is that takes you away from the everyday routine vacation homes right let's be a little bit more positive that's possible as well um just breaks vacations time in solitude um sleep your dream life all of these are 12th house themes so whatever is going on at the time of this eclipse it's something new in this area that's coming into your awareness and it's part of the larger story playing out on the 12th and 6th house axis because scorpio opposite taurus is in your 6th house which is about your daily routine hard work health care um it's about um kind of how you are in service your your work and that can be paid work or unpaid work um, it is about pets, if that pertains to you as well. And so, you know, there is this, um, like the sixth house is, is the, the daily order and the, the, the daily grind um, and our kind of physical health, generally speaking. And the twelfth house is how we escape the daily grind in whatever form it takes. Um, it's how we retreat. It is about, it tends to be more about our mental and, and spiritual health. Okay. So that's the axis. These eclipses, the storyline is playing out on the challenges may come in some way, shape or form from Saturn in the ninth, um, which is about a number of things like your worldview, your philosophy, your ideologies, um, your sense of higher learning or higher education in some way. Um, people at a distance. So people far away, uh, people that are different from you, who live in different places, you know, things you can learn from people in places that are different from you. And that's why sometimes we talk about travel in the ninth house. So it can be about travel, like far away travel. Um, it can be about religion in, in some instances, um, justice, the law, um, publishing, you know, getting your message out, that sort of thing. So whatever form that takes in your life, there may be some challenges there because that's where Saturn is, right? And making us do some some hard work in that area of life and it's in square to, to this particular eclipse to the nodes um, and then we've got I will remind you one more time to leave things off on a, on a high note look for the helpers in Pisces whatever shape those helpers take right it could be people it could be events situations organizations um, it, you know it runs the gamut but that's where all of the helpers are in the support and the support in Pisces right now, which is your 10th house of career, of public reputation, um, of the legacy you wish to leave, of your relationship to authority and authority figures and your own authority, of parenting, of, of parents in some way. So, you know, of, of you as parent, it could be like, it's usually like the, the parent who's the authority in some way, 
um, or it could be, you know, your, your own parents or other authority figures in your life as well. So that's what's happening for you, Gemini rising. Um, definitely listen to the introduction and we're going to move to cancer now. So cancer for you, you have this eclipse in Taurus happening on, um, April 30th in your 11th house. So this specific eclipse is in the 11th house of the group. Your friends, associates, networks, um, clubs, organizations. Very much about your allies and your supporters. Um, and your hopes and dreams for the future. So there's something new happening here in this area of life. There's something being initiated, something coming into your awareness, something you are conceiving of or is being conceived of by the universe that relates to, to some new, you know, event or, or, or storyline um, that in this 11th house because it's a solar eclipse, so it's a new moon. And then the other piece is the fifth house across the sky from the 11th is where Scorpio sits. So that's the other player in this eclipse story overall. And the fifth house is about how we have fun in life, what brings us joy and pleasure, our hobbies and special interests, our creative pursuits, and how we kind of shine as an individual out in the world. It has to do with children, our children, um, children we're associated with. It has to do with um, romance, you know, pleasure, those sorts of things. So there is, you know, like a story progressing here along this 11th, 5th house axis. And it's playing out over, you know, a sort of a two-year time period. And it, it really began in November of 2021 when we had that first eclipse in Taurus. And now we're really kind of getting into the crux of the story here, right? With this eclipse in Taurus and then the next one in Scorpio on the 16th of May, which I'll be back to talk about then. But this is the, this is the axis that the eclipses are hitting for you. And then you have Saturn in your eighth house. So Saturn is challenging in some way because it's in square to the nodes, right? at the time of this eclipse. Saturn is squaring the notes. We talked about all of these pieces in the intro, so don't skip it. But Saturn is bringing the challenges um, through the eighth house of, you know, the eighth house is a challenging place and it's a complicated place. It's about our, our entanglements with other people, um, other people's resources, which could be money, time, energy, um, things like, De taxes, debt, insurance, loan, wills, inheritance, scholarships, all of this sort of thing. Um, money that comes, that has to do with your, your partner's income. It can have to do with um, our psychological depths and healing, you know, the metaphysical on some level. The eighth house is associated with this the concepts of death and rebirth, this transformational sort of, you know, cycle that goes on. Um, and I don't know if I mentioned this or not, like our, our intimate connections with others. And when I say intimate, it doesn't just mean like sexual relationships. It, it's psychological intimacy, you know, intimacy on, on every level is also the eighth house. It is our, our fears, our, it can be about our fears, our obsessions, um, the skeletons in the closet, you know, these sorts of things. And so Saturn's there challenging, right? Bringing some obstacles and calling for some hard work and some adulting and responsibility. But on the, um, to leave things on a high note, we've got Pisces, you know, in your ninth house, which is where all these helpers <laughs> or wanting to support and uplift and, and bring some, some grace, uh, and support, you know? So, and that is in your ninth house. Now I know we've spoken about this in past videos. I'm going to talk about it again because it's important and we need that, you know, sense of silver lining, um, to, to kind of 
that sense of cautious optimism right now. And so that's coming from, you look for your helpers or, or your support in some way, shape or form from your mindset, like your, your, your sort of worldview. I mean, um, your, your ideologies, your belief system, um, your, some sort of higher learning and knowledge, learned people, um, teachers, you know, people that can teach you something, people that know a lot that they can impart their wisdom onto you, or you may be the one who's doing that for others. Um, people at a distance, people in places at a distance. So, um, and this is why the ninth house is sometimes related to travel, foreign travel, but people in different cultures, different, different places, people that have different ideologies from you, um, publishing, you know, getting your message out can be ninth house related. Justice and the law can be ninth house related. Religion can be ninth house related. So these, you know, the expansion of your horizons in some way, that is the area, those and all those ninth house themes I just mentioned, where all those planets are moving through Pisces, right? And Venus and Jupiter are coming together. And, and so that's, that's the hand of grace right there. Um, and so, you know, look to those themes for, for help. Okay. Moving on to Leo now. Leo, for you, this eclipse in Taurus is happening in your 10th house. And that house has to do with your public life, your ca career and worldly ambitions. Excuse me. Dry throat. Um, the legacy you wish to leave, your um, public reputation, your sense of authority in the world, or, you know, your relation to authority figures in your life, um, which could be parents or the, the parent that is, you know, was more the authority, um, parenting on some level. So, and then... So, so that's where you're looking for something new to come in for you, something new coming into your awareness, something new being conceived of, being launched, being initiated. It may have a bit of a surprise factor, a sudden uh, factor to it because of the Uranus there. Um, but this is part of a larger storyline, right? Because the eclipses are on the 10th, 4th axis playing out over this duration that we talked about in the intro so the other piece of that puzzle is Scorpio in the fourth house across the sky from Taurus in the 10th and so for you that's um you know not for you but for everybody the fourth house signifies home family roots real estate place of living your foundations your ancestry um the the legacy that has been left to you um also you know this is access of parenting in some ways like I said in the fourth house tends in, in in my experience to, to signify more the, um, the more nurturing maternal figure in your life. And it doesn't necessarily mean the mother, although it could, it could be parents in general, but, um, that's, you know, my interpretation generally. So this axis is where the eclipse story is playing out for you. Is that started Sometime in the fall of 2021, when we had the first eclipse in Taurus, but now we're really getting into the crux of the story here, right? That will continue to play out over the next 18 months. Now, you've got the challenges happening in, in your seventh house, which is where Saturn is sitting in square to the nodes of the moon, right? And so Saturn bringing the challenges, the obstacles, the um, demands for hard work and responsibility, and that is in your seventh house of one-to-one -one relationships. So significant other, um, close friends and family members, um, contracts and agreements, rivals, you know, that you, that you are aware of, um, like people you're kind of in direct competition with that you're aware of. So th those are, that's the area of life where, where, you know, relationships can feel a bit challenging because of Saturn. Um, something going on with your partner. It could be, it could be like something going on in your partner's life that is feeling challenging for you. Um, 
Now, the good news is we've got all of this goodness going on in Pisces, right? I'm going to talk about it again because it's important. Um, and for you, that's the eighth house. So we have the helpers in the eighth. We've got Venus and Jupiter coming together, the two benefics in the eighth house. Um, you know, coming together in Pisces hasn't happened since, you know, the mid 70s. So for you, the helpers are in the form of eighth house themes or people. What could that be? Well, the eighth house is about other people's resources. Um, that's one signification, right? Meaning money that comes from other people, loans, inheritance, wills, um, scholarships. It could be things that have to do with debt, taxes, inheritance. Um, it could be things that have to do with your partner's income. It's also about your intimate connections with other people, right? Intimacy on in every form it takes. It's about your deep psychological um, world and, you know, the wounding and the healing of that. It is about this cycle of, of, of death and rebirth, of transformation, of evolution. This is the eighth house. So... There's something going on there that's really quite positive. And it is where to look for the support, for the help, for the hand of grace, right? Um, in these times right now that we're in. So I'm going to leave that there, Leo, and I'm going to move on to Virgo now. Virgo, for you, you have the eclipse happening in your ninth house. So um, this specific eclipse in Taurus on the 30th takes place in your ninth house of expanding your horizons of um your worldview of getting your message out to the world you, you know it could be like publishing speaking these sorts of things teaching you as the teacher or the expert or the guru or encountering other people that are that that and you, you know to you it can be about justice and law and um sort of uh, religion is ninth house it can be about foreign people and places foreign cultures, foreign travel, th things you learn from people and places that are different from you, right? So these are all ninth house themes. You're, you're, I think I said ideologies, worldview. And this is where the this specific eclipse is happening. Solar, new moon eclipse. So something new there. A new beginning could be like a sudden new beginning because Uranus is there. It could be, you know, a jolt, a disruption, an aha moment, an insight. Um... A flash of genius, a sudden message, just something that's sort of unexpected that happens or that may be a, like a bit of a disruption um, in your ninth house. But it's something new, an initiation of something, conceiving of something new, right? And it's related to also what's happening in your third house because Scorpio is in your third house across the sky where other eclipses on this axis will take place. And this is the storyline playing out for you. This is the eclipse story. It's the ninth house and the third house for you. Um, you know, over these next 18 months kind of thing. And the third house is about your immediate environment, your neighborhood, your community, your peers, your siblings, um, people who feel like siblings, um, teammates. It could be like short travel, short trips. Um, it could be related to learning and teaching as well. Usually that's like, you know, elementary school, high school, sort of learning the basics of things, teaching and learning the basics, um, communications, vehicles, technology, commerce, marketing, all of this is the third house related, very busy place, the third house. So this ninth third house axis is the eclipse story for you overall. Now, <clears throat> Saturn is in your sixth house, bringing challenges. It's in square to the nodes of the moon at the time of this eclipse. And it is challenging in the sense that it's bringing obstacles, uh, hard work, nose to the grindstone, um, asking you to master something, um, you know, calling for responsibility and maturity and patience and all these things as it pertains to um, your sixth house of daily work, the daily grind, um, health and wellness matters, healthcare, illness, um, 
how you are of service, your work, whether that be paid or unpaid work, can, can have to do with pets in the sixth house as well. But, you know, the sixth house is like the daily order and, and what has to get done on the day to day, to put it simply. So that's where the challenges are for you. But we have all this beautiful energy in Pisces, right? I'm going to talk about it again because this time we've got Venus and Jupiter coming together, the two benefics in the seventh house for you. Um, you know, and Venus and Jupiter haven't come together in Pisces since the mid 70s. And this is this is good. Venus rules this lunation this eclipse so that is in your seventh house of partnership of your significant other in some way uh your like it could be marriage partner if that pertains to you or a significant other close friends and family members um you know that you have a one-to-one -one connection with um business associates potentially contracts and agreements also um like rivals or competitors right that you are in like you know that you're in competition with them so this is where the helpers are and the helpers can take the form of people um, or events or situations or or anything really um, in the seventh house it may also be really good things happening for your partner that of course then trickle into your world experience right so it could be that as well um people helping your partner in some way or just something that's going on for your partner. And so that's the bright spot. Okay. So that is for you, Virgo, Virgo rising. And I'm going to move on to Libra now where Libra, you have this eclipse happening in your eighth house. So this specific solar eclipse in Taurus in the eighth house of your psychological wounding and healing in the eighth house of other people's resources meaning other people's money um time and energy it could be things like taxes loans inheritance um debt scholarships bursaries you know lottery um those sorts of things um it's about intimacy the eighth house as well your intimate connections with other people right and in every form that that takes it's about this sense of transformation of 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 death and rebirth right of of uh, evolution that goes on so this is this is the eighth house um it goes it runs deep and this is where the eclipse is happening for you and but there's a new something new coming in at the time of this eclipse because it's a solar eclipse so it's a new beginning a fresh start something new being conceived of or or conceptualized or initiated in some way um and it's also connected to your second house like the larger eclipse story that's playing out on the taurus scorpio axis for you is, a, is about eighth house, second house, right? Scorpio sitting in the second house of, pardon me, your personal resources. So your personal money, time, and energy, how you get your basic needs met, survival kind of, basic survival, um, your sense of sort of stability and how you... Um, it's like all those things that you, you know, you, you need for basic living, right? So your, your, like the food you eat, um, your, your shelter, your, um, your resources, your material possessions, your money, um, all of these things. It's also very much, the second house is very much about your self-worth, what you value, what you place value on, and your sense of self-worth as well, okay? So this is the, the storyline. It, it's pertaining to the eighth, second house axis, which is the axis in many ways of um, the physical and the metaphysical, of physical form and transformation of your resources and other people's resources, okay? That's the eclipse story in the larger sense. This eclipse is in the eighth house. Then you've got Saturn in your fifth house bringing about some challenges and really requiring some hard work, some maybe some patience, some um, throwing some obstacles in your path, 
and asking you to be responsible and all of these things as it pertains to fifth house themes of children, whether they be your children or other children you're somehow connected to, your personal um, creative contributions to the world sort of thing, how you shine out in the world as an individual, your um, sense of pleasure, like what, what brings you pleasure, how you have fun in life, um, your hobbies, special interests, a uh, sense of even like romance and fun, that kind of thing. This is fifth house, right? So that's where there's, there's some challenges going on. Now, um, the really good news is that all of the goodness um, is there in Pisces, right? Again, in the sixth house for you, Libra, um, Libra rising. And we've got Venus and Jupiter coming together there for the first time um, since the mid seventies. And it's, this is bringing this sense of optimism in some way, uh, cautious optimism, the hand of grace, if you will, um, coming in, right? The helpers in the sixth house. And the form that takes for you is six house themes of um, illness, health, health care, um, pets, of your daily routine, daily work, whether it be paid or unpaid, how you kind of spend your, your days, you know, your daily routine, checking off the ticky boxes, I call it. Um, it's about how you are in service in some way. So there is something good, positive, optimistic, hopeful going on in that area of life. So that is uh, where to look for, you know, I'll say the phrase again, where to look for the helpers for you, Libra. Um, but the eclipses on the eighth and second house axis for you. So I'm going to move on to Scorpio next. Scorpio, you are another big player here in this eclipse um, cycle because the south node is in your sign, right? And so for you as a Scorpio, Scorpio rising specifically, you've got this eclipse in Taurus happening in your seventh house. So the uh, solar eclipse on the 30th in the seventh house of one-to-one -one relationship of your significant other, um, your partner, or the significant people in your life that you're, you have like a close relationship to. It could be contracts and agreements are implicated here as well, as well as things like rivals um, or competitors. So there is something new happening in this realm, right? At the time of this uh, solar eclipse, it is a, a, a fresh start. It is a sudden moment of awakening. Uranus is there, right? Bringing this sort of shock and disruption factor or the, the, um, the sort of quick, you know, quicksilver kind of factor. Um, there is like a fresh start, like I was saying, something new being conceptualized or conceived of. Whatever it is that newness has to do with that area of life, the seventh house. The other piece of the puzzle is what's going on in your first house. Um, and for you as a Scorpio rising, that would be the house of self, of you, of your physical body and incarnation, right? Um, your, your, your vitality, your appearance, um, how you kind of move through the world, how you come at the world, how the world perceives you. It is about... Um, you know, the first house is the helm of the ship. It's what steers everything else. And so things that happen in the first house tend to be significant. Now, because it can pertain to everything in your life and on some level. So this is the other piece of the this eclipse cycle story, right? The larger eclipse story is happening on this axis of you and the other. So the other significant people in your life, seventh house, you, the first house to put it real simply. So that's the larger storyline that's going on for you. And then you have Saturn uh, in your fourth house, which is in square here to, to the nodes, right? Which are implicated in the eclipses. So it's bringing some challenge, some difficulties, some obstacles, some hard work, some call for patience and maturity and responsibility. And that's in the realm of home, family, roots, 
the legacy you have been left, real estate, um, place of living, parenting, your parents, your role as parent, um, you know, family life, that kind of thing, right? Is, is where Saturn is, like I said, calling for some maturity uh, and responsibility. But then in the fifth house, you have all this lovely stuff going on in Pisces, right? So, so in particular, at the time of this eclipse, you've got the eclipse ruler Venus um, in a conjunction with Jupiter and thought to be particularly in ancient times, a very, very, um, and in Vedic astrology, a very positive conversation between Venus and Jupiter. And so this is happening at the time of this eclipse in your fifth house. And it's where to look for the helpers. It's where to look for um, the hand of grace, you know. And it's it has to do with children. So your children, other people's children that you're associated with in some way. Um, issues around like pregnancy or child bearing, that kind of thing. It can have to do with romance, with fun, with what sparks joy for you, with how... Um, with what brings you pleasure, you know, the things you like to do for, for pleasure. Um, so your, your creative self-expression is fifth house as well, creative projects, that sort of thing. So this is where all this goodness is happening. That's where you're looking for, you know, the sense of sort of relief or the, the reason for cautious optimism or these kinds of things that I was speaking about in the intro. So that's for you, Scorpio. And I'm going to move on now to Sagittarius where Sagittarius, you have this eclipse in your sixth house. So, excuse me. The sixth house is where the Taurus eclipse on the 30th, 30th is. Solar new moon eclipse. So a fresh start, a something new coming into your awareness, something new being conceived of, um, conceptualized, intended, what have you, that revolves around um, sixth house themes of daily work, right? Paid or unpaid work. Um, your, your sense of service, also pets, and also very much about things health related. Um, you know, healthcare, illness, these sorts of things, your physical health, or just something in, in that realm, right? So there's something new going on here. And there's also another piece to this puzzle because eclipses happen on an axis and the other end of that axis is Scorpio where the south node, node is. And so these, the eclipse story in general that's playing out that began in November of uh, 2021 in some way, whether you, whether you were conscious of that or not at the time, right? That's when sort of things began to, to really, um, move into this realm the story began to to, to well the story began <laughs> let's put it that way um Sagittarius and and it's it's about this axis of of health and wellness so the sixth house I was talking to you about the twelfth house would be more the the sort of mental um and spiritual elements of of health also having to do with how you retreat from the daily grind right and the daily order so it's more about like the chaos on one level, but it's also about um, how you spend time in solitude, how you take a step back from the world, how you um, retreat. It could be about things like vacation, um, but it could also be things that take you away from the daily grind. Um, places like um, hospitals, spiritual retreat centers, long-term care facilities, um, prisons, detention centers, rehab facilities, all of these things could be implicated here. Um, the 12th house speaks to sort of the, the endings in some way, um, the wrapping things up in some way as well, right? It's the last house. So this is um, this axis, right? Sixth, 12th house, where the eclipse story is playing out for you. And then you've got Saturn in your third house, bringing some challenges. So bringing a sense of responsibility, um, call for maturity, hard work, patience, all of these Saturn themes in the realm of third house siblings or people who sort of feel like siblings, right? Um, cousins, 
com your community some in some way, shape, or form, technology, um, vehicles, commerce, marketing, communications. These are all third house themes. So that's where some challenges are arising. But then you've got all this lovely energy in your fourth house because that's where Pisces sits for you and, and that's where goodness is happening and Jupiter and Venus are coming together in that uh, area of the chart now, right? Which hasn't happened since the mid-70s and Venus is the ruler of this eclipse. Um, so this is where you're looking for the hand of grace for the support system in some way um, and that is through home, family, this is the fourth house, place of living, real estate, roots, um, your ancestry, the legacy you have been left, um, parenting, parents, this sort of thing. This is where the, the cause for cautious optimism is coming from for you. And that's, uh, so that's for you, Sagittarius. <clears throat> I'm going to move on to Capricorn now, where Capricorn, you have this eclipse in Taurus happening on April 30th in your fifth house. So this is the house that speaks to themes of children, your children or other people's children or um, issues around, you know, children, including things like pregnancy. Um, it can all, it's also about pleasure pursuits, the things you do in life for fun and, and joy, um, romance, you know, your creative pursuits, creative endeavors, that sort of thing. These are all fifth house related. How you sort of shine your individual light out into the world. And that's where this eclipse is happening. Um, so there's something new transpiring here because it's a solar eclipse, new moon. Uh, and so something new being conceived of, being initiated, being um, brought into your awareness, right? And it could have a bit of a disruptive factor because Uranus is there or a shocking factor or a sudden illumination or flash of genius or something like that in relation to whatever this new thing is and whatever this eclipse brings about. Um, but the other piece of the puzzle here is Scorpio in your 11th house, which is across the sky. And that's the other piece of this eclipse story. And the 11th house has to do with the group, with allies, supporters, friends, networks, associates, you know, um, people that are trying to help you get where you're going. It's about your hopes and dreams for the future. So this is, um, this axis is where the eclipses are playing out. Something got off the ground here in November, even if you weren't aware of it at the time, that is part of this eclipse story and that's kind of where it all started and now we're getting into the real crux of the story here um, and we will continue to do so you know and this story will play out over the next 18 months kind of thing so on that fifth 11th house axis and then you've got Saturn with which is sorry I have something in my eye Saturn is um, bringing some challenges some obstacles some calls for patience and maturity um, and responsibility in your second house of your personal finances and resources. So, you know, so when I say resources, it's like your money, but it's also your time and energy. Um, it's about what you value and what you place worth on and your sense of self-worth and how you get your basic needs met. You know, it's about survival instincts and this kind of thing in the second house. So that's where the challenges are, you know, um, but Saturn rewards hard work. So there's that going on. And then there is some real support happening in Pisces. So you've got, this is where you're looking for your helpers, for the hand of grace, for your, um, for, you know, cautious optimism and, and, and all of that in the, the, the Pisces third house for you, which is about siblings. Um, people who feel like siblings, you know, cousins, uh, neighbors, community members, your immediate environment and the people in it. It's about communications. It could be about technology and it can be about vehicles, short distance travel, you know, short jaunts kind of thing that you're making. Um, it can be about commerce and marketing even. Third house is a busy place. So, but there's support here for you. And so, 
you know, take the universe up on that, so to speak, right? That's where you're looking for, for your helpers. And so um, I want to remind you of that because at this particular time, we've got Venus and Jupiter coming together, like I said, and that hasn't happened since the mid seventies. Those are the two benefics, right? So the goodness is concentrating there in that, in that place, in that area of life for you. All right. That's for you, Capricorn. We're going to move it on to Aquarius now. Now, Aquarius, for you, this particular eclipse in Taurus is happening in your fourth house on April 30th. So your fourth house of home, family, roots, ancestry, the legacy you have been left, real estate, um, parents, parenting, your emotional sense of security. And there's something new going on here, right? That's coming into your awareness, a sudden insight um, something new being conceived of, new seeds being planted in some way, but it could be a bit of, it could be d disruptive or a bit shocking um, or surprising because Uranus is there close to, to the sun and the moon at the time of this eclipse. But then in the larger sense, you've got um, the other piece of this eclipse story is the south node in Scorpio in your 10th house, right? And we covered what all of that means in the intro, so don't skip that. But the 10th house is your your career, it's your public life, it's um, your public reputation, and, and it's the legacy you wish to leave. It is about authority and authority figures in your life, your sense of authority. Um, you know, this is the axis of parenting in some ways, of, of your private life and your public life, of home and career. You know, these are the themes that are incorporated in this larger eclipse story that is playing out now um and we're really getting into the crux of, of the story at this point in time so that's where you're looking for eclipse themes and then you've got saturn in your first house right so saturn is is challenging um you to it's calling for maturity for hard work for responsibility um, it's bringing, it could be bringing difficulties and obstacles, um, and, and these all revolve and, and requiring patience. And these all revolve around the first house it's, it, because Saturn's in your sign Aquarius, right? Now, the good thing is, is Saturn rules your, your sign in traditional astrology. So it's strongly placed there. Um, but you know, it, it's, it's not all fun and games with Saturn. And so whatever like it can feel like you are burdened in some way in a very real way because the first house is you it is your physical body your vitality your um it can be your appearance in some ways it's how you come at the world you know how you um how you approach the world how you steer your ship kind of thing how the world perceives you so First house things can feel big because they can really have an impact on our whole life. So you've got those challenges there being presented by Saturn. Um, but then you've got a lot of goodness in Pisces um, in your second house. And so this is where there's a reason for cautious optimism. Um, there is a, the hand of grace, you know, coming in to support you and lift you up. Um, and, and, and it's the silver lining in some ways. We've got Jupiter and Venus meeting up there at the time of this eclipse, right? I spoke about that in the intro. And for you, this this has to do with, because it's in your second house, your personal resources, your finances, the money you make, um, how you get your basic needs met, your time and energy. Um, it's about your survival instincts. It's about um, your sense of self-worth what you place value on. These are all second house themes. So there is something very supportive going on in this area of life for you at the time of this eclipse, you know, and around this, these times that we're in right now. So, so draw on that for, um, for support. All right, Aquarius, I'm going to leave that for you. And I'm going to move to Pisces now. Pisces for you, this eclipse on the 30th in Taurus is happening in your third house. So it is a solar eclipse, as we spoke about, which is a new moon. Um, so there is a sense of something new happening here, a, a new beginning, a something being conceived of or conceptualized or initiated as it relates to siblings, 
um, close, like people who feel like siblings in your life. Sometimes that's cousins, community members, you know, peers, what have you, friends that feel like family. Um, it can have to do with your immediate environment, right? And the people in it, short trips that you take. It can have to do with vehicles. It can have to do with technology. It can have to do with school, teaching, learning on a, you know, elementary, high school kind of level or learning the 101 of things on a base level. Um, your, what else did I forget there? Commerce, marketing. Um, these are all third house themes, right? So that's where the eclipse is happening. But then there's another piece to this eclipse story overall, and that's south node scorpio in your ninth house the other side so part of this eclipse story overall revolves around ninth house themes of far away people and places of long distance travel of your philosophy your worldview your belief system um teaching and learning where you are either maybe encountering a a teacher or teachers um, or some kind of higher learning program or course of study, um, or you are that, you know, to, to others. Um, publishing, getting your message out, religion, justice, law. These are all ninth house themes. Expanding your horizons, foreign people and places. Um, you know, the, so this also plays a role in this eclipse story. And then you've got Saturn bringing about some challenges and that's coming from your 12th house. So Saturn is calling for maturity, responsibility, adulting, you know, um, really stepping up, mastering something potentially, um, requiring patience, all of these Saturnian themes. And that has to do with your 12th house, which is many number of things, but it is how we retreat from the world and from the daily chaos, time and solitude, um, that can happen as a result of like going on vacation uh, or taking, you know, a, a retreat. It can happen in, it can have to do with things like places that take us away from our daily routine. So sometimes those are places like retreat centers or rehab facilities or hospitals or hospices or long-term care facilities or things like that, right? Or vacation homes. Um, or it could be about endings and um, like the endings of things is the 12th house as well. It's the last house, right? And it can be about um, your, your spiritual and mental health. It can be about what's beneath the surface, sort of unconscious behaviors or even your dream life, sleep things surrounding sleep. It can have to do with, um, you know, your, your self-sabotaging behaviors. I don't know if I said that already, but those are all 12th house themes. So that's, you know, where there's some challenges going on, but then Pisces, you have so much goodness happening in your sign, right? Which if you're a Pisces rising, that's your first house. So your first house of self, of your physical body and being and vitality and appearance and how you come at the world and how the world perceives you and sort of how you steer your ship, you know? Um, and, and there's so much good stuff going on there, including the ruler of this eclipse Venus in a conjunction with Jupiter, right? The two benefics coming together. And this is cause for optimism for, um, you know, that sort of like the hand of grace coming in to support us in some way. This is where you're looking for the silver lining in some way, right? It's all happening in your sign. So very cool. All right, Pisces, I think I've said enough there. Definitely listen to the intro. And I'm going to move on to last but not least in this case, we've got Aries. And Aries, for you, this eclipse in Taurus is happening in your second house, right? April 30th, solar eclipse in Taurus. In your second house of your personal resources, your money, your time, your energy. Um, so the money you make from your job, whatever that may be, or your business or what have you. Um, it, it's about how you get your basic needs met. Um, it is about, you know, survival instincts. It, it, it is about what you place value and worth on. Could be about your material belongings, anything you own and possess. Um, it can be about your sense of self-worth. 
So this is where the eclipse is happening. And the eclipse is bringing, you know, it's a solar eclipse. So there's something new here, new moons, solar eclipses, um, being initiated, being conceived of, conceptualized, you know, coming into your awareness. And it could be surprising, shocking, sudden, because there's Uranus there, close to the sun and the moon. Um, and then the larger eclipse story also encompasses the opposite house, which is the eighth house, right? Scorpio south node in your eighth house over this eclipse season and cycle in general. And we spoke about all that in the intro. Um, but the eighth house is other people's resources, other people's money, loans, taxes, insurance, debt, wills, bursaries, scholarships, um, inheritance, you know, taxes. I think, I don't know if I said that or not. And it's also about our psychological wounding and healing. It's about our intimate connections with others. It's about this concept of death and rebirth, um, you know, that, that happens. So whatever's going on is playing out on the grander scale, you know, the grander eclipse story. It has to do with second, eighth house your resources, other people's resources, the world of form and material things versus the metaphysical um, and the transformation of such, right? And then you've got Saturn squaring the nodes at the time of this eclipse. So Saturn bringing some challenges, some obstacles, some calls for patience and maturity and responsibility. And that has to do with your 11th house of the group of allies, supporters, benefactors, friends, networks, associations, clubs you're associated with, those kinds of things. People that are helping you get where you want to go, your hopes and dreams for the future. So there are some challenges there, some difficulties um, that need to be overcome as a result of Saturn, uh, that Saturn's calling, you know, for from you. And then the good stuff is all happening in Pisces in your 12th house where we have Venus, ruler of this lunation, coming together um, with Jupiter, right? So those two benefics are coming together at the time of this eclipse. And there's like, and Mars is also there. You know, Mars rules Scorpio in, in ancient astrology. So like this is where there's opt a cause for optimism, hope, hand of grace, some kind of support, um, you know, beauty, what have you, mysticism, I don't know. I, and that word mysticism just came to me because this is all happening in your 12th house, which is a house that can be associated with mysticism, among other things, about your spiritual life, about your mental and um, emotional and spiritual health, about how you escape the world in some way through spending time in solitude, through retreating from the daily grind and daily order right um and that can be through vacation through retreat um it can be through sometimes like it involves things like spiritual retreat centers and or things like rehab facilities or hospice hospitals or hospices or prisons or detention centers or anything like that can be implicated here um it can be about our self-sabotaging behaviors in the 12th house, things that are, you know, in the unconscious. It can be about sort of endings and losses and in some way as well, because 12th house is the last house. But the point is, is that we have good things happening here. There is support happening here. Um, and so there, there is something uplifting that can help you through difficult times that is transpiring in relation to these 12th house themes. So, you know, you can kind of look for the silver lining there um, in some way, shape or form. So that's for you, Aries rising. And that is all 12 signs. And did we ever talk about a lot? And I feel like there's so much more I could talk about here. But I hope that gives you something to go on. If you have questions, comments, leave them below. Please remember to like and subscribe. Visit me over at my website, astrologymaven.com. I will catch you next week for a shorter video, an astro nugget, right? We've been doing those for the last uh, little bit now. And then I will catch you in two weeks time for the horoscopes for the next eclipse, which is the total lunar eclipse in Scorpio on May 16th. So definitely tune in 
um, for that because that is like the other side of the story that we'll go into to detail about then. Okay, take good care and I will talk to you soon. Bye for now.